Well, our next presentation is by one of our uh, distinguished faculty who I had the pleasure of uh, being associated with at the Wilmer Institute at Johns Hopkins, where she was one of our brightest uh, residents. And then she came to the Baskin Palmer Institute, where I had the pleasure of having her as one of our uh, brightest and distinguished uh, fellows in cornea and external disease. Uh, Lee Ji Su has now uh, joined the faculty here um, after a brief visit to New York City and is now back in the sunshine. And we're really happy to have her uh, spearheading our efforts to create a center for the molecular study of keratoconus. And she's going to give us an update on treatment for keratoconus 2012. Lee Ji. Thank you. What an honor to be here today. Um, So I'm going to be talking about what to expect in 2012 in terms of diagnosis and treatment. As we know in, in the talk given by Dr. Stelting, keratoconus is uh, the most common corneal atasia, and uh, the hallmark is that it starts early. So if we can um, target these patients early and diagnose them, we can treat them. And as we uh, mentioned before, uh, 10 to 20 percent will ultimately need corneal transplantation. So this is the typical time frame that we uh, see in our patients. You have a young patient that comes in with a shifting refraction. Uh, we perform topography and we find that they have a regular astigmatism. And often we're going to fit them for contact lenses or maybe even spectacles. And as we watch them, they're going to get more protrusion, steepening, and thinning of the cornea. And unfortunately, some of these patients will develop visually significant scarring and intolerance to their contact lens. So, is that the best we could do for these patients? Um, no, because with the advent of corneal cross-linking, we need to focus our uh, research on early detection. We're finding these patients earlier and earlier in our laser vision correction centers where we're performing topography uh, on these patients. Um, but other modalities such as uh, Pentacam and the ocular response analyzer are um, giving more um, descriptions and um, um, showing these patients earlier and earlier on. Um, experimental modalities such as the ultra-high resolution anterior segment OCT and ultrasound may also further delineate these patients, these early keratoconic patients, and allow us to treat them with something like corneal cross-linking. So this is an image of a patient with a pentacam where we can see changes in the posterior curvature when area of elevation is detected. This is a more suspicious elevation that we may see in an early cone patient. And the ORA, or the ocular response analyzer, um, helps us evaluate corneal biomechanics, uh, namely corneal hysteresis. And we find that in after LASIK and in our keratoconics, there is a decrease in the hysteresis. What about in research? Uh, this is a group, uh, the Artemis uh, very high resolution ultrasound. Uh, this is a group uh, uh, with uh, Reinstein et al. and Ron Silverman at Columbia uh, looking at epithelial changes in our early cone patients. And what we're finding is that at the apex, there's an area of thinning in the epithelium surrounded by an area of thickening, like a donut um, epithelial pattern. And we can use that theory and test it with something like an ultra-high resolution OCT. This is a spectral domain uh, ultra-high resolution OCT built by Dr. Jay Wang at the Baskin Pomeroy Institute. And it has an axial resolution as low as 2 microns. So we may be able to epithelial test, um, map out the epithelium in, in our early keratoconic patients. Um, as mentioned in Dr. Stolting's talk, uh, the rationale for cross-linking is that the biomechanics uh, of keratoconic corneas are reduced. And we see this, uh, see less of, of keratoconus because of this pathologic cross-linking in, in diabetics and as we grow older. Um, just as a review, the process involves a photosensitizer, of, uh, uh, namely riboflavin, with UV light uh, causing uh, production of uh, radicals and cross-linking of, of the corneal um, collagen fibers, and you get a stiffer cornea. So as a review, the prospective sh uh, studies show efficacy in halting progression um, and, and flattening the cornea. And the original protocol, uh, termed also the Dresden protocol, involves removing the epithelium, um, administering 0.1% riboflavin, uh, exposing UVA light 370 uh, nanometers, and irradiating with a dose of 5.4 joules per centimeter squared, and if you look at the patients who were treated in the early studies, prospectively, their KMAX uh, stabilizes. So as a review, the clinical studies have shown 
that indeed there is improvement in the uncorrected and best corrected visual acuity. There is a reduction in the KMAX and improvement in, um, in vision for some of these patients. Again, uh, interestingly, at a month, the vision and the corneal steepness can worsen uh, with resolution and improvement at three months. But different iterations of the current protocol are, as mentioned before, uh, what about preserving the epithelium? Some groups have used preoperative anesthetic with uh, benzalkonium chloride to loosen epithelial junctions and allow entry of the riboflavin. Um, if you uh, provide a transepithelial method, you're going to reduce postoperative pain and uh, re uh, reduce the risk of other complications such as keratitis. Um, our group at Baskin Palmer um, and other places are looking into other agents that will allow for um, epithelial penetration of the riboflavin. What about other means of uh, riboflavin administration? Well, some groups have looked at uh, creating a femtosecond laser-assisted intrastromal pocket. Basically, a lamellar cut is made about 70 to 100 microns below the surface, and a, uh, a side cut is made through which riboflavin is administered. And Dr. Stolting mentioned the use of inophoresis for um, improvement of riboflavin um, um, entry into the cornea. What about shorter treatment time? The current protocol looks at uh, 30 minutes. So 30 minutes in a clinic is a long time. So if we can accelerate our treatment protocol, um, increase the irradiance and short, shorten the treatment time, that may be a, a better option for, uh, for our patients. But um, you know, after all of this cross-linking, you know, looking at the topography and you have the patient in front of you, they still tell you, you know, the vision's not that great. So what can we do about the vision? Um, so groups have looked at, namely sequential same-day uh, PRK followed by cross-linking. Uh, they advocate topo-guided PRK. This is um, limiting it to about 50 micron depth, so thereby not um, really achieving emetropia, but smoothening the surface. Um, some groups advocate transepithelial PRK to remove uh, the epithelium and smoothen the anterior stroma to further decrease irregular stigmatism. And the benefits to same-day treatment uh, is that you minimize potential scarring and you're going to avoid ablating cross-linked tissue. So what about other cross-linking agents? Uh, glyceraldehyde was mentioned in the past. Uh, there's a group at Columbia looking at beta nitro alcohols. The, um, this is all in the experimental stage and in animal studies, but the potential benefits are that you, know, you avoid removal of epithelium. And you know, think about it, you could put, uh, provide this in an eye drop form. Um, you know, for our mild to moderate keratoconics with a clear optic zo optical zone, we're still going to offer them intracorneal ring segments. You want to have them steepest K less than 58, uh, at least 450 microns at the uh, 7 millimeter optical zone. You're looking at about three diopters of flattening. And again, this will not change the progression of disease. Um, so what we're looking at in the future is combination treatments. Can we combine intracorneal ring segments with cross-linking? Can we uh, provide topo-guided PRK with cross-linking? Even consider a fake IOL with cross-linking, or the mix of everything above, and this is a big area of research uh, uh, going on right now. For our, uh, for our surgeons who are still performing penetrating keratoplasty, I think there should be a shift and um, and uh, for our surgeons to learn uh, DALK or deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty and offer this as an alternative to PKP because the risk of rejection is lower as we preserve the host endothelium. Um, if you have a femtosecond laser available in your facility, you may want to consider also uh, uh, intralase enabled keratoplasty or IEK as part of your armamentarium to provide this procedure for patients so that there would be less uh, uh, postoperative astigmatism. So this is, this is my algorithm for keratoconus treatment in 2012. I think the key is early detection, namely because we have cross-linking available now. If we can focus our energies on finding these patients early on and cross-linking them, and uh, what we look forward to is combining treatments uh, with cross-linking, such as the intracorneal ring segments and topo-guided topo PRK. And for our more advanced patients, I think there should be a shift more towards providing DALK or possibly uh, even IEK. So if I see a young patient with, uh, with keratoconus, I think cross-linking is the first thing that I should offer them. Uh, if there's an early to moderate cone, I may want to consider a combination treatment in the future intracorneal ring segments, plus or minus cross-linking. 
if I have an advanced keratoconic patient who's young, who has a fairly thick cornea, cross-linking may still be an option for them. And for our older patients who have scarring or thin corneas, we may want to shift towards the ALK. So thank you very much. Thank you.